Praise God, man. I, uh, first off, um, I'm honored, Pastor Clarence. I'm honored, First Lady. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I never take lightly an opportunity to be able to grace the stage. Um, not only that, but I want to give honor also to my wife, who I wish could be here with me right now. But my, my youngest, my oldest son, he's in soccer, and so he's, uh, he, he has a soccer game today. So, so, so somebody had to stay back. Uh, but don't worry, my wife, she sends her love, which is me. So you get me. And uh, if my phone goes off and if it says sunshine, then I'm going to answer it. I'm going to tell you that right now. Well, one thing that we, we practice in my house is no matter what I'm doing, I always want my family to know that they're first. So if she calls me because something happens at the game or something, I'm going to answer it. Be quick. We'll get through it. I know, you know, in church, you know, usually with protocol, it's always like, don't do that because you're going to mess up the anointing. No, it'll still be there. God didn't change it. It ain't going nowhere. Uh, I, don't, I don't really get too tough into, into all the religious structure like that. So I just do it how, how I go. Because <laughs> I've learned at the end of the day when the, when the church culture, when the church body forsakes you, you better make sure your family is there with you. <laughs> that nucleus. But nevertheless, before I jump into the word, let me pray for each and every one of you, heads bowed, eyes closed. Thank you, dear Lord God, for this opportunity that we have to be able to minister into your precious sheep. Father, allow me to do what I cannot do in my own flesh, and that is to preach your perfect word. God, open up every, he every ear to hear, open up every heart to receive. Let every word that flows forth from my mouth, let it, let it be as a seed that is sown upon good ground. Use my tongue here this morning, this afternoon, as the tongue of the penny red writer, ready to etch upon each and every heart of those in the sound of my voice. I thank you, God, that as I minister, that the Spirit of God shall come behind it and shall minister a word to each and every person that is specific to the need that arises today. God, may you be glorified in this time that we have with you. We bless you and we thank you for it. Through and by Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. So you have your Bibles. I want you to, to I want to take you to uh, John chapter 5. I'm reading out of the uh, New American. John 5. Uh, we, my wife and I, we live in California now, but I grew up in Mississippi. I was born in Mississippi, so if I get kind of country, I got a little twang to it. I got to deal with the twang. <laughs> I deal with the twang. We'll look at John chapter 5. We're going to start at verse 1. I'm going to read down to verse 12. Y'all okay with that? I'm going to do this. Verse 1, after these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, to which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, with five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. Verse 5. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there for a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you wish to get well? Verse 7, the sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but when, I'm coming, uh, but when, I, but when I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your pallet and walk. Immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, it is the Sabbath and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, he who made me well was the one who said to me, pick up your pallet and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, pick up your pallet and walk? Who is the man? If you're taking notes, you want to put a title to this. The title is, What's Your Excuse? What's Your Excuse? There are a couple of things I think that are extremely important to the context of the verses that I just read to you. The first thing is the setting. It took place in a pool that they referred to as Bethesda. Bethesda translated means a house of mercy. 
This is particularly interesting because this was not necessarily a place where you would, you would think that Jesus would do a miracle. This was more of a pagan, ritualistic type of, uh, type of setting. In fact, this really had nothing to do with God. What they were doing there in that portico at that pool was they were believing and more so in the God of medicine. That prayerfully that if they were to jump in and it will be miraculously healed. Although the verses here say that an angel of the Lord came and stirred it up. The theologians believe that those verses were not a part of the original text. Which means that the people who were there were practicing this pagan ritual just to believe that, you know, somehow, that, 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 that me jumping in, I'm going to get my eyes healed. But we understand that Jesus chooses very peculiar settings because he wants to confound the wisdom of the religious. That's why you'll notice that Jesus didn't do all of his greatest miracles. He didn't do them in the temple. He did them in places where the crowds were because Jesus was all about making an impact. Let's make some noise. Jesus was all about going to the place that nobody else wanted to go to. He was about touching the people nobody else wanted to touch. A man of leprosy came up to him. And you know, if you know anything about, about leprosy, you don't touch them. Because if you touch them, then if they touch you, then ultimately the mindset was that you will then take on the disease. But Jesus touched the man with leprosy and saw that man become healed. Jesus, that's just, that's just, that was in his nature. That's just how he was. Jesus always, let me make a big splash. Let me confound the wisdom of the religious. Yes, it was on the Sabbath, which is why specifically Jesus told him to pick up his mat. It would have been enough to just heal him. But Jesus says, no, pick up the thing that you've been laying on. The setting of this is extremely important. Not only that, but it says that it was, it was located between the sheep gate. The sheep gate, biblically, was the place where you would, they would go to slaughter the lambs. And if you know anything about slaughtering, if you know anything about the Old Testament, then you know sacrifice is a big part of the Christian experience. So not only were the people sacrificing the lives that they had so they can just lay there, hoping that each and every day when that pool got stirred up, that they would be the first one to jump inside and ultimately to get the healing that they so desperately need. This was the setting of the place that we're in. Bethesda. Bethesda. Now, these people, they went to the pool to seek healing. As I was looking at this, I see major uh, comparison between the pool of Bethesda and church culture as we see it today. And asking the question, just really just asking the question, what do you really want from God? See, each and every one of us, we came in here with our own needs, our own desires, our own questions. Everybody in here came with something different. Some people came in here because you want your marriage restored. Some people came in here because you want God to, you know, deliver your kids. Some people came in here because you're looking for God to help you pay your bills. Some people came in here because you're looking for God to help you with your mind. Some people came in here because you're about to lose your mind. And you don't know where else to turn. Some people came in here because you just needed a word of encouragement. Because if you don't get encouraged, where are you going to go? What you going to do? Everybody came for something different. Just like at the pool of Bethesda. Now this man had been lame for 38 years. But other people who could have been there, they could have withered arms. Some people could have been there, they could have been blind. Whatever it was, whatever the case that they had, whatever ailment of the body, everybody went to the pool for something different. And here we all are. In the pool, looking for something different. But hoping that once that bubbles up, we can be the first one to touch it. And if we do prayerfully, prayerfully, we'll be healed. You know, we ask ourselves the question for, for church culture nowadays. You know, it's almost like, you know, why, why, why do we come? Why do we do it? Is it for entertainment? Is it for enlightenment? Do we come for encouragement? Do we come for healing? What do we come for? That pagan pool in Bethesda, it shows us how, man, it shows us how we can idolize a place, we can idolize a position, 
And Jesus can come along and change our reflection of it. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you what I, what I mean by that. I'll tell you what I mean. Because nowadays, it's not, we, have, we have a lot of different pools. It could be the next, you know, flashy big-time preacher. But we feel like, I got to get a word from that person. Because if that person don't give me a word, then I won't get a word. It may be the next, you know, the next song that just came out, the next gospel song that just came out. If I don't hear the word that comes from, from the song, then I won't get the healing that I'm after. Whatever that next big shiny thing is, that's what we feel like we need. Hoping that if I touch it, or maybe if it touches me, it'll give me the healing that I so desperately desire. Um, the desire part of this, though, is that when the man who had been there for 38 years, he said, well, first Jesus came to him, and Jesus said to him, he said Jesus already knew. He already knew that this man had been there for a long time waiting for healing. So Jesus didn't even bother to converse with him about his ailment. And I know a lot of times we want to, you know, we want to go to God and we want to talk to God about everything that's going on. And God's like, I already know. <laughs> Jesus didn't even bother with that. First thing Jesus asked him was, do you want to be well? But notice the man didn't answer the question. And first, instead, he gave an excuse. Well, you know, every time I try to get into the water, Somebody always comes before me. I don't have anybody here to help me. If only I had somebody else to help me get into the water. If only I could, if, if, if only I had this. If only I had better reflexes. If only I could get in quicker. If only I had somebody to help me. If only I had the money to do it. If only I had the, the, the resources behind me. If only I had the team. If only I had it. If only I could, if only, if only, if only. Whatever excuse that was offered, Jesus still did not. He didn't even respond to the excuse. All he said was, listen, take up your pallet and walk. To show him that, listen, the faith that you needed. Oh, Jesus. For 38 years you've been waiting on the wrong thing. 38 years you've been waiting on the wrong thing. And my question, my question to you is, have you been serving a pseudo-God? Because it's easy for us to say we trust him until you really got to trust him. It's easy to talk about loving people when you get around people and they don't love you back. It's easy to give when you got it. Come on, y'all. Really asking ourselves the question, do we really serve the living and true God, the one we sing about, the one we prophesy about? Do we, do we, do we really serve the living and true God? Do you want to be healed? Because the truth of the matter is, is that many of us, we are sick and don't. And I know, I know, I know. Everybody here dressed up real nice, you know, got on your camo, got on your orange, y'all looking good, everybody's looking good. Maybe at the pool of Bethesda, they were wrapped up in sackcloth and ashes. The only difference between us and them is just we look better. That's it. That's it. That's it. No big difference in, in, really, in really the character. No big difference in the faith. It's just we look better. We may have more than what they had. But still at the pool, waiting. And there, there's God sitting right there with you like, hey, what you waiting on? I'm waiting on somebody to help me. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay, okay. You still going to wait another day? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to wait another day. What you waiting on? The new year. Because obviously that's magical, right? <laughs> 2020 almost killed me. 2021 almost took me out. But 2022 going to be my year. Man, hush. 2022 is going gonna, is gonna to be the same old thing. Why? Because it's the same old 
you. The clock didn't change you. You still by the pool. You still ain't healed. You still ain't healthy. You still ain't whole. And here's the thing. It's not because you can't be. It's just because your faith is misplaced. That's why I never even argue with people who try to argue. You know, I've, I've, I've had the opportunity, the pleasure of being able to travel all over the world, preach all over the world. And one of, the, one of my favorite places of preaching is over in the Middle East. I love Dubai, Abu Dhabi, all those different places. I love it, love it, love it. But I, I, I always, always, when I go over with my people, I always tell them, listen, listen, listen. I, I am, I don't, in the past, in my, in my, more, in my, more, in my, in my more zealous years, I love to argue back and forth with people about my faith. And then I would, oftentimes, I would meet people who they refer to themselves as non-believers. Well, I'm a non-believer. I don't, believe, I don't believe in nothing. And I would say, you a lie. Because everybody believes in something. Like, you can walk in here today and say, I'm a non-believer. No, nah, bro, you believe in something because when you sat down in that chair, you believe the chair could sustain you. Not nailing one of y'all when you walked in, looked at the bottom of the chair and said, they got screws in this chair. How much does this chair hold? Because I know how much I weigh. Can it hold me? Let me look at the chair. Let me, let me, let me test it down in it. You just sat your behind down in it. Why? Because you had faith in something. It's not that you don't have faith. It's just that your faith has been misplaced. And you just got a lot of excuses in the middle of it. Oh, if somebody else would help me. Oh, if I could just have this. Oh, if somebody would be there for me. Oh, this person won there. Oh, if this could happen to me. No. Oh, You know what you'll do if you really wanted to be healed? There's a story in the Bible about a man named Naaman. I won't even get into the whole thing. But this man, he was, he was, he was, he was top general in the country. So much so that so much so that the king will converse with him. Naaman was responsible for helping what we would know as now as Syria, being able to, you know, being able to, to, um, to uh, defeat Israel. And so he was greatly known throughout his entire country. But he had a problem. He had leprosy. The Bible refers to it as skin disease. And you can imagine, you know, a great general, he gets dressed and he puts on his boots and puts on his pants and everything is starched and looking good. He puts on his shirt, puts on his jacket, covers himself up to make sure that no one can see the leprosy that he's trying to hide. Now, he's great. He's amazing. The people love him. They're shouting his name. He has the king's ear. But he knows that he has a problem. And this, the Bible says, this maid, she was so insignificant in how they, in how they spoke about her, they didn't even mention her name. This maid said to him as he was getting dressed, why don't you go over to Israel? There's a man there who could heal you which is a whole sermon in itself, which speaks to the fact that you never despise the words that come from somebody who you think can't speak what God told you. <clears throat> Naaman leaves. He gets, the, he gets the, the okay from the king, and he goes over, talks to the king. King's upset, all that kind of stuff over, over in Israel, over Jerusalem. And now <clears throat> he, he, finally, he finally gets before Elisha, and Elisha first slams the door in his face like, I'm, I, I don't have anything to do with you. And then he finds him, he said, go, go, go dip, go dip, you know, seven times in the pool. But it's interesting, and the point that I was trying to make here is that Naaman took with him 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. Which begs me to, act, to, you know, to, 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 uh, to ask you this question. <clears throat> Do you see what a man would be willing to give? to get rid of something that he doesn't want anybody else to know he has. Nobody else knows that I have this skin disease. 
Nobody else knows that this is what I deal with. Nobody else knows this is what's happening. Nobody else knows this is where my sickness lies. But Naaman said, I'm willing to give everything I got if I can just get the healing. Because there's a sense of desperation that overtakes you, right? There's a sense of desperation that begins to overtake you when you recognize, man, I really want the healing that I'm after. Because I'm just getting tired of being sick. But the sickness gets worse when you can't even admit that you're sick. Give me a couple more minutes with you, and I'm done. I'm from, I'm from Mississippi. You can't say take your time. <laughs> I promise. Give me a couple more minutes. Jesus asks him the question. He says, do you want to be healed? Which is the same question that each and every day when we wake up, when our eyes open up and our feet hit the floor, is the same question that we are confronted with each and every day. Do you want to be healed? And while we may not say no with our mouth, we instead take on worry, we take in doubt, we feed ourselves whatever we can to try to just get through the day. Most of us don't really live through days. We just kind of survive through them. Work is hard, got this going on at the house, seem like one thing fixed, another thing breaks. Seem like as soon as this gets up, that goes down. Can't get this relationship right. Finally, I look over here and this relationship broke. You, you know, my, my wife is doing work, is, is doing great now, but now I gotta deal with the kids. Seems like it's just one thing after the other. And all Jesus is saying is, listen, listen, I, 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 get, I get all that, I get all that, I get all that. But do you want to be healed? Are you okay with dealing with this? Because can I be honest with y'all about something? Some people don't really want to be healed because if they get healed, it'll take away from the attention that they have from being sick. And then I'm going to tell you something else. People nowadays don't really like healed people. When you free... People hate that because they despise that you can be and they can't be. <laughs> Free. I know so many people who are supposed to be doing so many things that God told them to do. You want to know why they don't do it? Afraid of people. Afraid of people's opinions. Well, you know, they said you can't do it. Oh, they said you can't do it. Oh, well, that person said you couldn't do it. Who cares? Oh, they said you won't be able to do it. I remember my wife and I, we were planning a marriage retreat over in Bali. And uh, we had, we were getting ready, we we're planning it all out. We had a call that was saying, yeah, this, this is not going to be something that y'all going to be able to do. And we, we was like, well, why? Well, we're not, we're not quite sure if, they, if, they're, if they'll be willing to let you, you know, do the, the ceremony and the way that you guys want to do it uh, there in, in the country. And I thought, if I'm paying for it. And you give me a microphone, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say what I want to say. We have just developed this type of mentality that whether you told me I couldn't or not, if I've been compelled by God, who are you? For some reason, we have become so enthralled by the opinions of people. But this is what we call it in school now. We call it peer pressure. Peer pressure is a pretty word for idolatry. Because what you're saying is, is that your friends have more pressure over you than God. The church is not supposed to be begging for the government. That was never the intent of the church. The Bible says that we're supposed to be the lenders, not the borrowers. It messed up when the politician became more important than the preacher. But I get the schemes of the enemy. Discredit the preacher, 
and you won't hear from the preacher. But then listen to the politician. It messed up because the roles got reversed. And now we're all sick because now we live in a land where the roles are reversed. The greatest house in the United States of America has not ever been and will not ever be the White House. It will always be God's house. The president, he trifles with, with, modern, with, with, with just temporary things. Change a few laws over here. Make a few executives order, or, or, or make a few executive orders over here. But it's the preacher who deals with that which is temporary and eternal. But nevertheless, he says, "Do you want to be healed?" Now, I want to talk to you about true healing, really quickly. When I come to Jesus. I know every one of my sins are forgiven. I don't have to question that. I don't have to question that. I know every one of my, every one of my sins are forgiven, which means I do not have to live in my past. While, while many of us who are seasoned in this, while we've heard that, while we know that, can I tell you one of the main reasons why a lot of people are so held back in sickness? Shame. Shame and guilt are not the same. Guilt says that what I did was a bad thing. Shame says that I am a bad thing. You know how many people I meet who, are, who live in shame? For years, I lived. I lived with a sense of self-hatred. I ask myself the question, where did that come from? Why do I hate myself? Shame. Even I came to Jesus, and I thought, Jesus, you, I mean, I've, I've said it, I've preached all over the world. Jesus, you've, you've healed me. I know that you, I know that you've taken away all my sins. But here I am, day after day, week after week, month after month, still dealing with shame. 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 And it eats you alive. Un unless your heart just becomes so callous that you just don't even care anymore. But it's a shame that begins to keep us at that pool. It's that shame that keeps us there so we don't find the healing that we so desperately need. And I know because people love to remind you about your past. People love, oh my God, people love to remind you of your past. And most of that reason is because most people, even church folk, are addicted to other people's pain. In church, we are toxic and we don't even recognize it. Praise the Lord on this side, gossip on this one. Sick. Sick. Now, this isn't to say that healing is perfection. But it is to say that healing is reality. Yeah. Yeah. Healing is self-awareness, which I'll talk about at the 3 o'clock session. Healing is self-awareness. Being able to admit, at least, I'm sick. I know some things have to change. I pastored for years. Finally, last year, every week last year, I went to, I went to, I went to go see a therapist didn't realize just how broken I was. How many things in my life that I, I, I just kind of buried under. I know men, how we do it, we just, we just suppress. We just take it in, we just suppress it. Take it in and suppress it. We got to be strong. We got to be tough. We got to be, got to be big. We got to be bad. We just suppress it and just suppress it. <clears throat> Not realizing that unless that stuff gets out, if you press down something long enough, when it bubbles out, you're you wondering why you're hitting walls now. That anger that's in you is trying to come out of you. It just came out in the form of a fist. That's why you hit her in the face. I don't need no help. I don't need nobody to help me. You're sick and you don't even know it. 
The next one. We get so <clears throat> stuck in the past that we start dealing with unforgiveness. I'm not even a prophet, but I can guarantee you in saying this statement, it's a thousand percent accurate. And that is <clears throat> that there are probably some people who are sitting in this place right now you're still controlled by somebody who's dead. They control you from the grave. They touched you as a child and you still can't let it go. They said something to you when you were younger, you stupid, you fat, you'll never amount to anything. You'll never accomplish anything. Look at you, you dirty. You'll never have the kind of marriage you want to have. You'll never have no money. You'll struggle all your life just like me. Person dead and gone and you still struggling with it. Won't forgive them, won't let it go. And you wonder why sickness is taking over your body. For anything happens in the natural, it takes place in the spiritual. That cancer that's eating you alive, it's time for you to let it go. When I come to Jesus, I'm free. Now, freedom doesn't mean I get a chance to act in the way I want to, but freedom does give me the opportunity to act the way I need to. But freedom doesn't hide my reality. One thing I can't stand, you know, and I'm so glad I know you, Pastor Clarence, but I'm so glad I, I know that, that y'all are just real people. You know, you get in church culture and everybody, you know, how you doing? Blessed and highly favored of the Lord. <laughs> blessed and highly favored. I'm blessed and highly favored. Is that how you're really doing? Yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm great. I'm just walking in the promises of God. Yeah. You a lie link in your breath saying, you know that ain't the truth. Well, you know something, preacher. I got to fake it until I make it. That's the problem. You become a professional faker. So even when you go before God in prayer, you can't even speak in reality. Father, holy God, I come to you now on bended knee. You ain't even down. As humbly as I know how, please bless my heart. What are you, what are you doing? They're like, God is this far away deity. Like, he's right there with you. Be like, yo, what up, God? Like, I'm stressed. Like, I am stressed out. I need some wisdom or some peace or bail money, whichever one you got. <laughs> when the church finally gets real, then people who are outside of it could stop looking at us and saying, y'all just fakes. Because it's real. I don't know what it is. It seems like you walk through the doors and all of a sudden it's like, put it on, put it on, put it on, put it on. Put it on. <laughs> and you walk right out the doors and you mean as hell. I don't get it. I don't understand it. I don't get that. I grew up in that. I grew up in that religious system. Well, I walked inside of that little small Baptist church and everybody had on the show. But I knew Sister Toucan would cuss you out in the parking lot <laughs> and throw you a bird when she was driving by. <laughs> Freedom comes in that place where I can accept my own reality. No, I'm not trying to achieve you. I'm not, no, I'm, I'm not trying to impress you. No, I'm not trying to achieve this level of perfection you think I have. I'm going to be me before God. And if you don't like it, tough. <laughs> One thing I know is that Jesus didn't go to the synagogue. He didn't go to the temple to find men and women to follow him. He went to the streets. He found some real people. And for some reason, in church culture, we make people believe that the only people who can truly serve God are theologians because they went to a cemetery, I mean, a seminary, and then somebody got a degree. And you got a degree. You got more degrees than a thermometer, and you still don't know God. But when you get free... 
You have to worry about who likes you, who don't like you. Can you hear what they said about you? I ain't hear it. Go hear it again. <laughs> they don't even know me. Oh, this person said they know you. They don't. You heard? You Did you hear? Did you hear what they said? No. Why were you listening? Oh, I know why. Because you sick too. So why don't y'all just sick people? Why don't y'all all keep hanging out at your pool of Bethesda? Now, this, I'm, I'm, these free people over here. These free people over here. So I'm, I'm going to do me. Y'all do y'all. So y'all sit over here and listen to rumors and accusations. and God. But did you Because it was on the internet. Okay? <laughs> Anything, everything's on the internet. This is what somebody said. Okay? <laughs> I told somebody the other day, I said, somebody said, you know, this person really, really hates you. Isn't that something? You can hate me, but you still gonna have to hate me because when you look at me, you cannot help but to know I'm still blessed, even when you hate me. Put me in the city, I'm blessed. Put me in the field, I'm blessed. Put me in jail, I'm blessed. No matter where you put me, baby, I'm still blessed. Your hatred doesn't change it. You killing yourself hating me. And here's the crazy thing, I don't even know you. If you came in my life and came out of my life today, it still wouldn't change my life. I don't even know you. And I'm still blessed. <laughs> but that's healing. True healing is reality. True healing is knowing my one responsibility is to please God in everything. That's it. And when he asks me, do I want to be healed? Then I know I need, to, I need to come before him with true faith. And saying, God, I know, I know I'm sick. You can't argue with somebody who don't think they need to be saving. Somebody don't think they need to be saved. It's like, well, I don't know what to tell you then, pimp. The house is burning down. But if you're going to stay in here, that's on you. That's on you. The house is burning down. That's like this nation today. I'm fin. I don't know if you want to play. I'm finished. If you want to play with, me. I don't know. I don't know. Pro I ain't. I ain't good with protocol, so I apologize. But, but um, I want to give you this. Is there's an old man who was running in and out of a building. And everybody was in the building. You know, they having fun, dancing, doing their thing. And uh, this old man would keep running back in, and he would say, hey, oh, y'all, y'all need to get up out of this building, get up out of this building, get up out of this building, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And the people look at him and say, man, get on up out of here, man. Like, we having fun. We doing our thing. We, I mean, man, you know, this is, this is fun right now. Get out of here. And the man would go in day after day. Hey, get out of the building. Come on, y'all. Come on. Get out the building. Get out of the building. Man, go on. Leave. Man, leave us alone. And there would be some people who would say, okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to go with you. And he would... He would take them down the stairs and he would say, there's only one way to get out of this house. You got to go through that door. There's no other doors. And they see, well, I see a bunch of other doors. He says, those doors don't work. There's only one way to get up out of here. We got to go through that door. So they would follow him outside. And he would get outside and he would, they would say to him, okay, so what do we do? And he says, okay, you know the way out? And he says, yeah, yeah, I know the way out. He says, okay, tomorrow we go back in the building. Why would we go back in there? Because the other people in there, they need to know the way out. But well, they keep ignoring you. Well, maybe, maybe today is the day. So the next day comes. They go back in there. They get discouraged. They get back out. They go back in. The next day, they go back in. They get discouraged. They come back out. Next day, they go back in. Some more people listen to them. They go back out. Now, all of a sudden, they get in the crowd, but there's still people who are inside. The old man finally goes in. He says, listen, everybody. Listen. That's what I'm telling you. The day will come when you won't hear my voice anymore. And in the twinkle of an eye, all of this will be in flames. A man interrupts and says, oh, man, you're just talking junk, man. Because in reality, man, if something were to happen, i just run up out of here real quick. The old man says, you won't have time. You won't have time. And plus, with all these doors around here, 
You don't know which one to go through. Man, he keep going back in. Next morning, the man gets up with his team. He starts to go outside, and the whole house is it's gone. And all the people who are inside of it, they all perished. Jesus met a man at a pool. He didn't ask him for his excuses. He didn't ask him about his past. He didn't ask him who hurt you. He didn't ask him who lied to you. He didn't ask him any of those things. The only thing he asked him was, do you want to be healed? And it's interesting because I heard Pastor Clarence earlier up here when he was, when he was, when he was prophesying, he said, this shall be a place of healing and deliverance and breakthrough. And if I could just add one more to that, Pastor, a place of free people. Who are free from the opinions of others. Who are free from the past that tries to hold them back. Who are free from the pain that tries to hold them down. Free from the stress that bothers and torments you so much that you can't even sleep at night. You pop pills not because you like it. You pop pills to numb the pain. Somebody asked me, you know, well, pastor, can I smoke weed or not? Because we've been trained in a sense of legalism, right or wrong, right or wrong. Is it good if it ain't, if good or bad? The question is not, can you smoke it? The question is, why? That's it. Because I'm stressed out. So is that going to be your reason? Are you saying that's the God of healing that's going to help you not be stressed? That's all I'm asking you. I'm not telling you it's wrong. I'm just asking you to evaluate who God going to be in your life. That's all I'm asking you. All I'm asking you is, do you want to be healed? Because once the high is gone, you still got to deal with whatever it is you have to deal with. That's all I'm asking you is, do you want to be healed? That's it. That's all I'm asking you. I'm not, I'm not telling you one way or another. All I'm asking you, well, can I have sex before marriage? Look, I'm not asking. I'm not telling you yes or no. I know what the Bible says. But what I'm going to ask you is, what's the benefit? That's all I'm asking you. I'm asking you, do you want something healthy and whole? That's all I'm asking you. All I'm saying is, is patience. Is that more important to you than instant gratification? That's all I'm asking you. That's all I'm asking you. All I'm asking you is just to value yourself more. I'm just asking you how much you value you. Because if you don't value you, nobody else will. But that's all I'm asking you. Do you want to be healed? So I believe it's some people in this place who say, I want to be healed. And I got a charge from heaven. I want to pray over you. I want you to just do a simple thing. I want you to stand up at your seat. And I want to pray over you. You say, I want to be healed. Whatever the past, whatever that thing you've been holding on to, whatever it is, this is that place of release. It is that place of surrender. It is that place where God meets us. And we're going to pick up our palate. And we're going to walk as free people. Whew, Jesus. Whew. If you're in here and you say, man, I'm looking for a healing. I'm looking for healing in my body. Heart murmurs cancer. I want this to be the place you get your healing. And just like Jesus said, he told that man, he said, pick up your pallet and walk. I want you to go back, pick up your pallet, go back to the doctor. Prove him in this, that his healing power still works. So Father, whew, 
by the grace and the authority that you have laid upon me. I pray, God, that you touch each and every person that's standing on the sound of my voice. I pray for those who are joining me right now on live stream. I pray that there's, and I thank you that there's no distance in your precious spirit that your healing power can find them. God, I pray for those right now who are situated in deep unforgiveness. I pray that they open up their mouth and by faith they say, I forgive. I pray the weight just falls off of them. For those who've been dealing with sickness in their body, God, I pray that you touch their ailment and you give them wisdom on how to care for the temple that you occupy. For those who've been troubled in their mind with depression and anxiety, I pray the Prince of Peace. I pray Shalom overtakes their house with such a thick presence that when visitors walk through their doors, they sense your presence in the house. God, I pray for any other gods that we've now taken into our home, that we indulge in through our mouth, through our eyes, through our ears. God, I thank you that you take away the taste from it. And you fill us with that self-discipline not to go back to it. And by your grace and your mercy, I believe by faith that this can be done. And that this truly becomes a house of healing. We believe it. We thank you for it. Through and by Jesus' name. Amen.